Joining me now is Dr. Robert Redfield, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Redfield, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Obviously, we, we have to touch on the news of the day, which is uh, the CDC taking action on evictions and, and the moratorium on them. Uh, you know, as we're seeing this pandemic continue to affect Americans, uh, explain the thought process on, on why the CDC was able to take action while we're waiting for Congress to sort of make more progress on something like this. Well, I think the importance to recognize that homelessness is a, an important risk for COVID transmission. And uh, the uh, opportunity to try to prevent individuals from losing their stable housing, where they would either go into concongruent housing with other individuals and therefore put at risk potential for further COVID spread or uh, tragically could actually uh, become homeless. And so using our public health authority uh, seeing this as a public health risk, uh, we uh, uh, were part of the president's executive order that, that wanted to uh, try to interrupt evictions at this period of time. So for the next uh, four months, there's an interruption of evictions for individuals that make less than $99,000 uh, annually or a couple greater than, uh, I think, $198,000. Could the CDC extend this if, um, you know, if nothing happens in Congress um, in, in December, by December? It's conceptual. It could be extended. Uh, obviously, we're doing this in partnership uh, under our public health authority with uh, HUD uh, to make sure that uh, we try to minimize the disruption that may be caused by a, an increase in homelessness. Or and clearly having people, you know, cramped together in spaces is something that is continuously a struggle uh, for the country um, and something that I'm sure you're focusing on. And, you know, after Memorial Day, you mentioned that we saw a spike in cases within that two week period. Labor Day is coming up. What are the concerns there? I think it's really important because uh, uh, we did, in fact, see the Memorial Week uh, surge and then we saw a surge after Fourth of July. We're actually doing very uh, well now. We're improving. The uh, cases are coming down substantially. We've had a, probably a, close to a 40% decline in cases from the time we were peaked in late July, uh, and deaths are coming down. We want to keep that trend. Uh, clearly now with Memorial Day, we don't want it to become a spreading event. So we're really appealing to everyone to be vigilant about, about wearing a mask, to be vigilant about uh, social distancing, to be vigilant about hand washing, to be smart about crowds and really limiting any crowding that they would do. Stay away, obviously, from crowded bars for any crowded spreading event. And the other thing I'm advocating people do or really reflect on this Memorial Day weekend is to talk in their families about the importance of getting the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine is now available. Flu season is about to start. So it is really important. I don't think you can stress enough, enough on your news outlet how important it is to take serious Labor Day and to be really vigilant about the mitigation recommendations that we have. And let's tr make sure that Labor Day is not a spreading event. If it steeps with the downward trend, we'll be in a strong position as we enter October when the flu season really gets started. But if we have a spreading event right now, with Labor Day, then three, four weeks later, we're going to have that surge of new cases uh, and we'll, it will be much more complicated. So really appealing to the American public to let's be extremely serious this Labor Day about embracing the masks, the hand washing, the social distancing, avoiding crowds. And I, I would argue, make a family commitment to, to get the flu vaccine. Worst case scenario, if we do, in fact, end up with, uh, you know, another surge prior to the flu uh, season starting, what are what are the sort of strategies that you've had in place or that are being developed to, to help so that we don't have a repeat of what happened earlier this year? Well, I think that's the real challenge. I mean, that's the real challenge, Angelia. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I've said in the past that this could be one of the most difficult public health winters we've ever had with the convergence of flu and COVID. Um, however, if we're really vigilant about these mitigation steps, we're seeing the summer 
transmission of flu right now because we do get flu all year round, but flu over the summer, late, late spring and summer is the lowest level we've ever seen. So it means that these mitigation steps that we're using for COVID are also impacting flu. Um, but if we do have uh, a lack of mitigation and we do have a surge of COVID, you can see that if we have that surge now, it will, it will end up peaking four to six weeks from now. Uh, that's the same time we're going to start to see flu. Um, so again, I think all I can do is really appeal to the important uh, power that each of the people in our nation have to become a part of the solution by embracing these important mitigation steps. Uh, one of the other things, obviously, uh, that's a conflating issue is the uh, school reopenings. And we've seen already college campuses having to reverse reopenings and move to distance learning, as well as other schools. Uh, your thoughts on that and what we can do right now um, and, and how the schools can, in fact, tackle this. I know there are some areas where school is in progress, especially for younger kids. Yeah, first, I want to say a reopening schools K through 12. Uh, I've said it uh, before, I'll say it again. I think it is a critical public health uh, decision that the public health of the K-12s are best served by getting back to face-to-face -to -face learning. So we really do need to make a commitment to figure out how to get these schools open safely and sensibly, uh, obviously understanding in the process of protecting the vulnerable. And many school districts now are reopening just that way, safely and sensibly. Second thing I want to say is the risk of infection infection, COVID in schools, particularly now K through 12, that risk actually, those students don't get the COVID in schools, they get the COVID in their community. So the best thing we can do to help prevent COVID in schools is to control the COVID in the community, which comes back to all of us doing these mitigations. College campuses, very important. Uh, first, uh, we have the fastest growing uh, a uh, number of cases, if you do age demographics, is that, is that group uh, between 15 and 30. Um, we need to appeal to that group to really listen to that fourth statement that I said, avoid crowds, right? Be smart about crowds. Wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands, and be smart about crowds because a lot of these um, crowding situations, these parties and these gatherings are really becoming super spreading events. We want to uh, really appeal to individuals that uh, have COVID, obviously, to self-isolate. Um, we do want college campuses to really reflect on their decisions when they do have these outbreaks. We don't believe it's in the interest of our nation to have those students sent home and then reseed all different parts of our nation. We think the students should be able to be isolated on campus. Many campuses have got isolation dorms uh, until there's recovery. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then to try to really stress and enforce the importance of their student body that this is a chance for them to contribute to America's effort to win the war against COVID by let's forgo the parties for now Let's forgo the mass gatherings. Let's all act socially responsible uh, for uh, our fellow schoolmates and for our nation. I know that one of the things everyone is waiting with bated breath for is a vaccine. Um, and I know that there are um, antibody treatments um, in the works in, in, the, in the interim, but with the draft of the National Academies out yesterday on distribution, I'm curious on your thoughts um, on sort of, first of all, what they've said in terms of the grouping and the priority, does it align with the, the strategy that uh, you or in general Operation Warp Speed and the task force have looked at? Well, thank you. This is a, obviously a work in progress. The National Academies come out with their initial recommendations that really highlighted the, the four kind of areas that they focus on, the risk of acquiring infection, the risk of morbidity and mortality, the risk of negative impact on societal factors, and of course, the risk of transmission of the, the disease and infection. And so they proposed a, a multi-phased approach. It's out now for public comment. And it will go through that process and then come back and they'll issue a final report. That final report will be a component because ultimately the decision is the decision of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is also an independent committee that has credibility in this space for decades. 
making recommendations on how to use vaccines across the nation. And they will take the National Academy's uh, thoughts under consideration along with uh, their own deliberation. And they'll finally make a recommendation uh, to how they believe is the best way to begin to uh, distribute this virus, uh, this vaccine in an equitable way to make sure the allocation is equitable across this nation. Certainly don't want to be spreading the virus there. I, yeah. On the point of the uh, the hospital workers, I think there's one thing that I've had a lot of discussions about within the healthcare community, and that is hospitals employ a lot of people. Um, and so when you're talking about you know frontline workers receiving and being part of that initial priority, um, that includes a, a wide array of people, um, not just those who are wearing lab coats or uh, white coats and, and stethoscopes, um, but the, those who are maintaining the facilities and work within them. Um, any thoughts on on whether or not those individuals would in fact be included. Yeah, I think this has to be, again, part of the considerations, but I would echo what you said. When we look at risk to healthcare workers and we broaden that understanding, people that help the health system work, for example, in nursing homes, uh, the risk of uh, infection was not greatest in doctors or nurses or respiratory therapists. It was the greatest in nursing aides. Right, so just to echo that in hospitals, that you know, when we look at the broader issue, it's going to be really an understanding who's at greater risk of infection, and how would they benefit uh, that. And again, to try to make those initial allocations in an equitable way that really sets around the priorities. And the major priorities will be obviously risk of infection and risk of bad outcome from infection and how that gets sorted out in the final recommendations. You know, I have confidence in the uh, advisory committee of immunization practices. They've already had several meetings. Uh, they will be making these decisions based on real data of the vaccines, how they perform, where we know that they're gonna be able to be effective and safe. Um, and uh, I suspect it's really going to be those two groups, you know, the individuals greater risk for infection because of their employment sure. and the individuals at greater risk for bad outcome if they happen to get infected will be the initial groups. Sure. Looking at, at all of the, the changes sort of that the country has gone through, um, each individual has, you know, personally uh, been affected and changed a lot of their lifestyle. How have, how have you handled, you know, the outbreak and, and what changes have you had to make? I know you've also, you know, had to fly to different locations and, and other things. So what has the experience been for you? Well, you know, part of it is uh, uh, I'm kind of jealous of my clinical colleagues because my whole life I'm really a doctor. I practice medicine and I grew up practicing medicine, taking care of men and women that were trying to confront and live with HIV infection. And I went through some pretty tough times where most of my patients, unfortunately, died in the prime of their lives. So I really miss that practice of medicine. And I really want to applaud the men and women that make the health system work in this nation. It's that same sense of vocational commitment, though, that I want to applaud the teachers now that are stepping up to open up these schools so that the K through 12s can get back to school. So that's first and foremost. Uh, you know, I've tried to say one of the focuses of CDC is to make sure that all of the important efforts that we're doing, trying to end the AIDS epidemic by 2030, combat, you know, teenage nicotine addiction, you know, uh, going after drug use disorder to make progress, confronting maternal mortality. I've told the team, you know, we can't let those public health objective goals go on the sidelines here, that we have to keep those moving forward right now to make, you know, progress. So 700 women die in this country a year just giving birth to a baby. We have to really continue those efforts and make sure that we don't have that. So, you know, I, I continue to uh, be optimistic that we're going to come out of the stronger with a stronger public health system in this nation. Clearly that's one of the areas that I think people open their eyes to that we have underinvested in public health in this nation for far too long, you know, 
well, for probably over 50 years. And it's time to make that investment in data modernization, laboratory resilience, public health workforce, you know, and our global health um, security uh, footprint around the world so that, that we're well prepared to confront the pandemics like this. Right now, I will say we're, we're preparing earnestly for what I anticipate will be reality is that there'll be one or more vaccines available for us in November, December, and we have to figure out how to make sure they're distributed in a fair and equitable way across the country. Um, I will say the first couple years at CDC, uh, it, it was the time of my life. You know, I love science, I love data, I love service. I'm surrounded by over 20,000 men and women that are trying to use their skills to improve the human condition day after day, and I saw progress. Uh, I will say the last nine months in the middle of war, you know, because this is a real battle. This is one of the most critical, complicated public health crises that this nation has faced in over a century and to extend it the world. Uh, and to sort of be in the middle of that, uh, it's, 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 it's a big effort. I mean, it's an honor. But I sure liked the first two years a lot more because I was seeing meaningful progress in making meaningful improvements in a variety of areas, all the way from one end from the drug use disorder, all the way to another area that ending the AIDS epidemic, fighting an Ebola outbreak. I'm on my third Ebola outbreak now in, in the Congo since I've been CDC director, taking on uh, the increase in nicotine use among high school and middle school and elementary school thing and trying to reverse that, going after maternal mortality, trying to make meaningful programs to confront health disparity. I mean, every day was kind of fun because I was trying to divide my energy and encouraging different really talented people to accelerate their efforts to improve the human condition. In the last eight months, it's been very focused on helping this nation confront uh, the war that we're fighting against this pandemic. And I'll close. It's been, it's been really a, a, a significant change for you, I'm sure, just in daily operations. Big change. Um, and, and there's been a lot of political sort of back and forth as well. I'm, I'm curious about the World Health Organization and other bodies globally. Has the political tension affected your ability to work with colleagues overseas? No, it hasn't myself. I think in general, people see CDC for what it is. It really is the premier public health agency in the world. Um, and we're really focused on that, is how to use data and science to improve the human condition. Stay focused on that lane. I do have to you know, try to encourage my colleagues, because they're really outstanding men and women that work at CDC, uh, not to get distracted by the critics. Um, you know, sometimes I wish the critics would understand that they do have the potential to suck energy out of people that are trying to do the right thing for the right reasons. Uh, so the criticism is not always benign. It can actually change the enthusiasm, the earnest. And so I, I think the hardest thing that I, and the most important thing that I, do as a director now is remind the men and women how important they are, how valuable they are, how their work is valued, and how they have to stay focused on, if we'll say, focused on the goal line and not get distracted by some article in the newspaper or some criticism on one of the news shows that, you know, this is an agency that's not used to having negative criticism. So, you know, but I will say that We've worked, you know, earnestly. When I got the first models back in late February, early March, uh, it was a very difficult time for me because those models by very smart people in my agency told me that they anticipated a million to 2.4 million people would die of COVID before October 2020. Um, you know, that was catastrophic if you start to think about that. Uh, and um, um, I, you know, I think we all committed to do all we can to try to save human life. Uh, it's always hard to prove what didn't happen, but I do believe that the efforts that have been made over the last uh, eight, nine months have had an enormous impact 
on uh, saving human life in this nation. Certainly hope that we can continue that trend going forward. Dr. Robert Redfield, Director of the CDC, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be with you.